we were we are going to be um, we are going to be continuing um, online starting in September, but we're taking the month of August off. Um, and today uh, we're going to be talking about Italian affairs, philosophers and institutions. There are going to be um, two speakers, uh, Jonathan Regier um, and, and uh, David McComish, both of them from the Kaposkari University of Venice. Um, and each will speak for about a half an hour, followed by uh, questions for about a half an hour. So we're going to have two sessions. Uh, Jonathan is going to go first, and he's going to be speaking about the philosophy of threat, Girolamo Cardano and the Roman Inquisition. Jonathan. Thanks, thanks very much, Dan, Dana, and Claudia for organizing. I was just, um, I'm in my office and I was just, um, I noticed that there were cobwebs between my coffee cups and I was knocking the cobwebs away. And I feel like this is what I'm doing mentally for, the, <laughs> for this talk. It's been a while since I've given a talk and it's, it's, it's like a silver lining with it, just to be able, I, I guess without this situation, I wouldn't have the opportunity to, 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 to give such a talk to such a, to such a group. Uh, um, now at the end of July. So, uh, so, so thanks very much for organizing. Um, I would like to um, share my screen. So I'm gonna give that a shot to start with. Um, and I think I go to uh, meeting and then start share. Ah, I think that you need to, um, Claudia, can you can you enable share screen for Jonathan? I think it should be enabled. Can you try again? Okay, I'll try it again. Uh, okay, perfect. Keynote. Keynote. I should have checked this beforehand, but it's uh, so Zoom can share my screen. And my screen is the little green um, okay. thing in the bottom. So let me see if that works now. Um, keynote. Is that, can you see it now? Yes, we can see it. Okay, so let me make that um, uh, play um, view and then enter full screen. Okay, so I think now you see the full screen. All right, so um, it's, it's still it's still showing the program. I think you have to um, oh unview that. Well, if that doesn't bother anybody, it's it's okay to me. I'll slide okay. over. There we go. So among the um, the living natural philosophers, you know, natural philosophers who are alive in the second half of the 16th century, um, Cardano is arguably the most um, influential, um, I'm speaking in, in, you know, generally in the, in the Latin Republic of Letters, he's at least, he's at least one of the most um, influential. So he's widely read and, and cited um, everywhere. And part of the reason for his reach and renown is that he published in many disciplines. Uh, medicine, natural philosophy, astrology, and other forms of prognostication, uh, moral philosophy, and mathematics. His opera Omnia, which comes out uh, uh, long after his death in 1663, is a daunting 10 volumes. He's certainly one of the most strikingly original and prolific authors of the period. So his work has attracted some, some truly impressive scholarship in English, Italian, French, German, and, and other languages, no doubt. Um, but in some sense, he remains the province of a relatively few specialists. And there, there's a number of reasons. There are a number of reasons for this. Um, he can be difficult, at times an eccentric writer, um, especially compared to other canonical philosophers of the 16th and 17th centuries. Most of his work remains untranslated, although the last 20 years or so have seen some really great translations and critical editions. Many were done through um, 
the Cardano project uh, that's now centered at the University of Milan. Um, so let me, um, let me talk now and give it a little introduction. Oh, let me move it if I can. I go to the next slide. Oops, how do I go to the next slide? Oh, play, I forgot to hit play. Okay, there we go. This is a little bit of an, this is a little outline of his life. Um, his life was very complicated. Um, university studies in Pavia and uh, Padua, medical degree in Padua. He's a professor of medicine at University of Pavia. I've only got one personal detail besides his education here, which is that his eldest son is executed in 1560. Uh, and 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 that execution of his of his eldest son was a uh, a major moment in his life and precipitated his move to the University of Bologna, where he was a professor of medicine as well, and where he would have his Inquisition trial. His Inquisition trial starts in 1570. He relocates to Rome in 1571. He joins the College of Physicians in Rome, and eventually, in the few years remaining of his life, becomes a personal physician to two popes. So very illustrious career at a certain point. He had difficulties early on and then at a certain point, his very illustrious university career, very illustrious career as an author in many disciplines. Okay, so just to set the scene, this is a little, uh, a little quote from one of the inquisition documents. It's, it's the inquisitor in Bologna asking um, the Dean of the Holy Office, so basically his boss in Rome, what, what what your excellency is, what does your excellency think would happen if uh, Cardano saw himself stripped and attached to the rope? He was discussing the possibility of using um, um, the threat of torture against Cardano. So that just should uh, to set the scene. Now, why am I interested in threat and why Cardano? So Cardano and threat. So there's a whole richness and complexity to his work. And, and because of that, you could draw a lot of global themes, lines of interpretation, um, and I'm going to suggest one theme um, that I think can be described as unifying and almost ubiquitous in his work. And that is that the individual for Cardano lives in a network of, of threat, from illness to accident, uh, to chance events, to faults of intellect and memory, to ambition and passion, professional threats, spiritual threats, uh, you name it. Um, his sensitivity to threat um, is and to the general uncertainty of human life is at least partly due to his uh, to personal character. To his, you know, he he could be described as paranoid and uh, as a hypochondriac, and but and difficult in many ways. But it it goes a this sensitivity to threat goes a long way beyond just personal idiosyncrasies. I think. Now I and I'll well we'll get to that I, I guess. And, and now a few words about what I mean when I say threat, because um, I think it's important to have a working definition. Um, and I'm gonna give you my own working definition. So, so at a very basic level, threat is understood to encompass whatever an individual or group might consider harmful to themselves, uh, to the overall integrity of their station. Um, now, but what about the difference between threat and danger? So in the terminology I'm adopting, a threat is a pointed and articulated danger. Um, there's a relatively clear agency or structure that creates the threat. So um, like legal and completely acceptable forms of state coercion are often essentially threats. If you do X, Y, or Z, then this is gonna happen, this bad thing is gonna happen to you. Um, and the idea, the, the idea of ruling bodies as legal authors and executors of threat is untraceably ancient, but in the early modern period, you have very important and lasting formulations um, uh, uh, regarding the role of threat at, uh, uh, for the state, um, within the state. Um, so for instance, I'm thinking of Hobbes, um, where the idea is that civil society uh, in some sense needs, well, no, needs to be secured uh, partly by the possibility of coercion uh, through threat. Now, another example of threats when I'm, how I'm using it is um, uh, natural threats. So threats that arise because of reasonably well-articulated, well-conceived natural conditions. So illness, um, a well-defined illness. Um, and, and why, the reason I chose to talk about threat in this way is I need something, I need a concept that's sufficiently large to cover um, a spectrum of phenomena from so political, natural, philosophical, and theological threat 
And of course, theological threat is a, is a, is a very present, at times overbearing threat in the period. Um, and it's very concretely understood uh, in, in various ways. Um, and, and by I, theological threat, I shouldn't say it, spiritual threat, spiritual threat, or the threat of divine justice. And okay, so now why is threat interesting? So in the background to all this, but not so far to the back in the background is an interest I, I have in the rise of modern expert institutions and the secularization of institutions. And when we look at our own expert institutions, and so I'm thinking of universities, government policy centers, think tanks, whatever. One good indicator of their health, I'd argue, um, is their authority in defining a threat and constructing a response. So to put it bluntly, people go to an expert when they're in trouble. Um, and this, I would say this truism almost furnishes an operative definition of threat. So like in Europe and even more in the United States, um, I would say that quite, pow you know, quite powerful and, and very present um, political movements are openly, seem to be openly questioning, undermining uh, traditional state and scientific institutions. And at the rhetorical and conceptual level, uh, I think that uh, power, these kinds of power struggles often play out as struggles over who gets to define the real threats and the best responses. Now, why, um, why Cardano and the Inquisition? So that, that question of expert structures, expert institutions is part of the reason why I find Cardano and his Inquisition trial so interesting from this point of view of threat. Um, and, and I'm gonna take a look at how they both consider one, one kind of widely, you know, one, one sort of uh, ubiquitous essential thread of the period and that's heresy. So how do they consider heresy? How does Cardano consider heresy a, a, a threat? How does the Inquisition consider, consider heresy a threat? Um, the modern Roman Inquisition is founded is only founded in a sense in, in 1542. Um, and its job is to combat heresy. It's a counter-reformation instrument. It's also used within the church as a bureaucratic instrument to align doctrine and to centralize papal power, but it's, you know, it's, a, it's, it's an anti-heresy uh, group, right? Now, um, uh, the Cardano has a, basically a kind of a, a quasi-medical, a medical view of, he puts forth in one of his works a medical view of heresy. Heresy is essentially uh, a melancholy brought about by astrological conditions. And this view of heresy lands him in a lot of hot water. Um, so before I get to that, let me just mention one thing about threat and Renaissance historiography. Um, I think there's a good argument that the historiography of the Renaissance individual has always recognized the role of threat in this kind of, you know, standard, the new Renaissance person, the plastic, the plastic Renaissance nature, um, um, self-fashioning, all of that. So in, in Burkhart's, uh, the most classic take on the Renaissance uh, individual, if you the, the, this link between the individual and threat is rather on the tacit side, but it's, it's pretty clear that the politics of despotism uh, and exile make the individual aware of his or her promise for self-development in Stephen Greenblatt's um, in quite influential uh, Renaissance self-fashioning. Um, the link between self-fashioning and threat is more explicit. So uh, I'll quote Greenblatt. So hence self-fashioning always involves some experience of threat, some effacement or undermining some loss of self. And there's also a strand of historiography, of Renaissance historiography, arguing that a sense of general anxiety accompanied uh, the transition to uh, European modernity. So uh, a blurred boundaries. Um, well, I, I actually have a nice little quote from Edward Muir's The Culture Wars of the Late Renaissance. So uh, there's an anxiety, he writes, uh, uh, in, at, the, at the beginning of European modernity produced by a surfeit of creative liberty that collapsed categories, blurred distinctions, breached boundaries, and breached boundaries, the very bulwarks of cultural order that calm existential an anxieties. So, so I hope that gives you a kind of a, a little bit of a 
a constellation of points as to why I'm curious about, why I'm focusing on threat. Um, okay, now let me get into this case. Since I don't, I only have, we only have so much time. I just got my clock. I'm doing okay, so. All right, um, let me just go right into the trial. So um, in 1570, Cardano was arrested on in Bologna. He's a professor in Bologna, arrested on suspicion of spreading heresy. His trial lasted uh, several months, setting into motion an eventual prohibition by the index of all his works except the explicit mimetical. In the period of his trial, the modern Roman Inquisition was still relatively young. As I mentioned, it was um, founded in 1542 in its, you know, its modern form. Cardano was the most prominent of the first natural philosophers to be imprisoned and tried, at least until Giordano Bruno in the last decade of the 16th century. So thanks to the valuable scholarship of Ugo Baldini and Lane Sprout, Cardano's um, inquisition documents are very readily available, uh, edited and published alongside those of many 16th century natural philosophers. Cardano's file is by far the largest. It's, it combines hundreds of pages of sort of bureaucratic memos, but, uh, not hundreds of pages of those, many pages of those, and then hundreds of pages of basically censor reports. The, uh, there was a great interest in his work. Um, so the work that initially brings him trouble is, the, uh, is his Dererum Verietate on the variety of things. Uh, and that's, you'll see it on the right there. Um, it's, this is the 1558 uh, edition here. It, it's published in 1557, the first edition. Um, it's a long treatise of universal natural philosophy. Um, it's a companion piece. He, he sees it as a companion piece to his best known natural philosophical work, the De Subtilitate, first edition in 1550. Okay, now, um, but again, it's the, 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 the trigger is the De Deum Veritate. And so to start an inquisition trial, you need to have an accusation, uh, a first accusation. And that first accusation actually comes from an inquisitor in uh, Como, um, who sends a letter of accusation to the Dean of the Holy Office in Rome and to um, the inquisitor in Bologna. And here, um, I've just, here's a quick translation, here's not a quick, here's a translation of the first substantive accusation um, I'm trying to close this. Excuse me one second. I want to try to. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Oops. Okay. Um, and among other errors, so this is the uh, inquisitor writing in Book Two, Chapter Thirteen of the aforementioned treatise where Cardano speaks of celestial influences, he so exaggerates them that he denies that God can act in inferior things. He denies the power of demons and calls the blessed martyrs crazy and driven by celestial influences into losing their property and life for the sake of uncertain things. And then he goes on to list a bunch of other uh, egregious uh, offenses. Um, Cardano calls the judges, he basically calls Dominicans, uh, the, the, the inquisitors, uh, wicked, impious, unjust, rapacious wolves, that's playing on the, the Dominican and the Latin. Uh, and he mocks as St. Augustine. And in chapter 81, where he speaks of miracles, he says that miracles are fiction, better part are invented by the testimony of priests whose nature is to lie. And then he teaches um, forbidden, prohibited forms of uh, prognostication. Okay. So this, this letter, I wanted to give you um, a few excerpts from this letter because it actually is sort of a mini version of later censor reports. In other words, there's a consistency to the many reports that would follow. Um, how do you explain that consistency among the many censors? Um, uh, it's that Inquisition censors operated via what I've called uh, hermeneutics of presumed guilt. So they start, so there's an initial volley of, volley of accusations and then Beginning with that, they then, they don't just collect heterodox statements from the books, they do that of course, but they classify and network them in an effort to reveal fundamental heresies. Um, so the, the reports are relatively self-confirming. And then the differences tend to be in the severity of the judgment that's delivered. Okay, 
Now, um, I'm going to consider now the first, I want to talk about the first sense report, a very, in, the, a very important first report of the day, re, of the De Rerum Verietate, of the, this treatise on the variety of things. This report is organized uh, by the Holy Office right after that initial accusation. It's also anonymous. We don't know who wrote it. Now, the main point of contention uh, that I'm going to look at concerns Book Two of De Rerum Verietate, um, which is devoted to the celestial region. And here, says the censor, Cardano subjects basically Christianity to celestial motion. And um, he, um, the brunt of the criticism is reserved for uh, a chapter on celestial influence. So um, Cardano, the censor set writes, uh, uh, has all mortals ruled by this celestial influence. And actually, those are Cardano's words. Um, he starts this, this chapter on celestial influence by writing, nobody should doubt that celestial influence exists and a cult that is an occult force by which all mortals are, are ruled. What then follows in the De Rerum Verietate is an extraordinary series of pages where Cardano attributes religious conflict and the proliferation of sects to the effects of this celestial influence. So who, he asks, has not marveled that so many men voluntarily desert their children and wives, their lands and countries, and even subject themselves to torture, all for so many varied opinions on religion. Moreover, these people can support great suffering as if they were petrified. They have a real uh, uh, capacity to, uh, to, to, for, for, physical, for bearing physical suffering. So there's little doubt that Cardano views a, the martyrdom, this kind of religious behavior as extreme, specifically because it entails mortal danger for uncertain gain. It also doesn't occur in isolated incidents, he thinks, but it tends to manifest in clusters. You have basically uh, waves of heresy and heretics. So um, all of this, he thinks, suggests a natural cause, and that natural cause is celestial influence. Um, and he goes on talking about other kinds of cycles in nature, you know, cycles where you see spates of failed or successful childbirth uh, or sickness or the appearance of prodigies. And he, and he goes, look, heresy is kind of like that. It's, it's a, 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 this natural cyclical thing um, caused by celestial heat, basically. This celestial, basically a natural physical cause. And he goes, I, I marvel at all these people who, although they see such an order of things in the sky, such power and magnitude of celestial bodies and in certain of the bodies like the sun and moon, such evident influence, they seek absurd, worthless and unknown causes, da, da, da. So those who say that God is the cause of all of this, and he's um, thinking, he's thinking of heresy. Those who think that God is the cause of all this, does it not shame them as if they said that a king was servant, sutler, soldier, and scribe under the pretext that he commanded them all? So Cardano then goes into what this celestial influence is. And he says that it's um, a certain measure of celestial heat. Okay, it's rather vague, but it plays on the humors. And that's the important point. It causes melancholy. And then he goes immediately into this question again of uh, this issue of people who die for their religious beliefs. And that's what he, he writes, for people who die for their religious beliefs. More or less, it's what he writes. So, um, when this celestial influence explains why they expose themselves to death for the sake of religion, why should we lay their deviance in the lap of God, given all the forms of worship that have attracted adherents willing to suffer for their beliefs? And here he goes on to write, or is God the author of contrary beliefs at the same time? Does he enjoy things sometimes in one way, sometimes in another, like an inconsistent man? Moreover, <clears throat> moreover will he care very much about how he is worshipped like the gods of the Gentiles? On the contrary, all these rituals were inventions of exceedingly greedy priests. What about the cause? What else but that black humor, which, stupefi which stupefies certain of them and drives others mad? Okay. Um, what we read in this chapter is something that I find quite noteworthy, and it's a direct link between martyrdom or heresy and celestial influence. Now, I should say that I, I don't think at any point Cardano ever says, this is what heresy is, stop. He's talking about some cases of heresy, but it seems he's talking about many cases of heresy. Right? And um, it's a kind of variant on the melancholy defense. Uh, what I, <laughs> in quotation marks, what I call the melancholy defense 
uh, that he uses um, in regards to witches as well. So the two most well-known witchcraft skeptics of the century, uh, 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 Johann, we Johann Weyer and Reginald Scott, would follow Cardano in ascribing witches' delusions to melancholy. But in these passages, Cardano's not really accounting for diseased flights of imagination. He's, but yes, but he's also extending the effects of melancholy to acts of religiously motivated self-harm. And so not only has he made witchcraft a medical matter, also in this, in the De Verietate, he talks about witchcraft, but it's not just that, but it's also heresy, right? Um, now, he's not the first to have thought of overzealous religious behavior as mad or melancholic. There, there are a few precedents. Uh, Ishak Ibn Amran's fairly well-read, well-known treatise on melancholy. Um, this is a, an Arabic, medieval Arabic, uh, 10th century, I think, Arabic uh, writer. Um, important uh, treatise on melancholy. He suggests there that ascetics and the very pious, ascetics and the very pious are susceptible to melancholic delusions um, through, a fe through an over sort of overbearing, uh, uh, too, too strong fear or love of God and such that they seem to have like a kind of love sickness. The early reformers, some of them, Luther included, um, also associate Anabaptists with uh, insanity and melancholy. Um, you know, the Anabaptist movement caused a lot of problems for the sort of uh, um, mainstream uh, Lutherans. I can use the word mainstream. Um, um, but, and then in the 17th century, the, the link between madness, melancholy, and religious enthusiasm would become more commonplace. But Cardano is unique in the 16th century, I think, because from his natural philosophical or medical perspective, or quite materialist perspective, you could say, um, the question of right or wrong doctrine remains quite beside the point. The very fact of sacrificing one's life, family, or basic well being for religious doctrine is, at least here, uh, lunacy. It's a kind of natural lunacy. Um, so I, I think it makes sense to add Cardano's views to the conceptual history of religious fanaticism. Um, a concept um, whose modern definition, at least one political philosopher, uh, Dominique Cola, has attributed has attributed to the uh, uh, to Philip Melanchthon, the, the important Lutheran uh, uh, philosopher. Melanchthon used "fanatical" the word "fanaticus" uh, to describe Anabaptists, whom he saw as threats to the political st structure supporting the Lutheran movement. But where Melanchthon understands Anabaptists to enact a project basically against civil society. Uh, um, so, so it's a kind of replacing a city of God, excuse me, city of man with city of God. Um, but this isn't really what Cardano is talking about. This kind of fanaticism isn't what Cardano has in mind. It, it's rather a, a sickness. Um, and so presumably the, the correct response of the church and the state would be to comfort or treat the individual rather than to mete out punishment. So what are the problems here? Well, one of the problems is that it's extremely important um, for, for the censors reading Cardano's work. One of the things that they have forefront in their minds is the uh, uh, absolute unassailable um, principle of free will. And the reason is, well, one of the reasons is that to begin with heresy is, I mean, if you go and if you look at the, of course, heresy is Greek, uh, heresis, it's a choice. Heresy has to be a choice. Um, the Council of Trent, so this is, we're looking at, the trial is very much still in the, uh, in the wake of the Council of Trent and the Council of Trent reaffirmed against Lutheran and Calvinist views the importance of human free will in accepting or refusing uh, spiritual gifts, in, in receiving or declining spiritual gifts. Cardano's medical view of religious variety uh, and relig religious heresy is, is blissfully unconcerned with um, the spiritual efficacy of human, of, of human will. Um, I would note that he doesn't argue for doctrinal tolerance here. He narrows the authority of the church to persecute. He also implies that the best way to avoid um, the sway of sectarian opinion 
and of uh, the temptation of heresy is to practice philosophy and basically understand the human body and the cycles of nature. Um, okay, so uh, I, it, if I may, let me, let me put, I'll, I'll stop there for a second. Um, let me pause the share and wait and come back to, let me see if I can do this. Let me do this. Uh, can you all see me again? No. No. Okay. Um, okay. Well, that's okay if you can't see me. Can you still see my 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 uh, uh, PowerPoint thing? Oh no, there you are. I'm back. Um, I have a. Can I can I maybe go on just for a few more minutes? Maybe maybe I can stop here. I'm um, sure. Yeah. Um, why don't, why why don't you go on and conclude? I'll conclude. Yeah. Um, and I'm actually going to conclude um, on, an, on another point. And you, you've probably been following that, okay, there's something else here. And there's questions of materialism and determinism at work here. Um, because the kind of, Cardano in, in the, these works that are, are being targeted in these sensor reports is not so, the, yes, he's interested in the passions, he's interested in the human mind, uh, but but very much the embodied mind, the impassioned the impassioned mind, the the question of free will is is in a sense not so not so important. Um, and I'd like to just show you one other um, one other thing. So um, eventually the censors would get to the De Subtilitate, which is his best known natural philosophical work. And I just want to show you one. I'm going to share my screen again and show you one uh, passage that attracted an absolute condemnation from one of the censors. And then I'll just, I'll, I'll use that to um, conclude. So let me go back to uh, start share and keynote. Okay. All right. So now hopefully you can see my keynote again. And all right, um, I'll skip that. Um, here's Cardano writing about love in, in, the, in the De Subtilitate. And this is in a wider discussion of um, the human, of the human body and the passions. And um, well, it's sort of, it's a rather complicated uh, uh, chapter or book rather of, of the De Subtilitate, but um, let me just look at this. So, so he's talking about love and he's talking about um, uh, physiological responses, uh, sexual responses. He goes, well, most men are in love because their vision is impaired or they're in love before looking at what they fancy loving. This is why very many men are in love even against their will. They're forced into it by the presence of an image of beauty, just like those who are seared by grief and the power of imagination does not entirely comply with the will. And if you do imagine something beautiful, you are not free to withhold your love. So when a beautiful form is accepted into the power of imagination, we are snatched away into love even against our will. This is why scholarly people are more powerfully in love because of the strength of their imagining faculty. I do not know if that is true, but uh, there it's asserted. And the censor, this censor is known and it's an important person, well, relatively uh, important figure in, in Inquisition uh, in what, sure, in the Inquisition uh, world in, in the period. But um, so this is him and he's directly writing uh, against Carnot here. So he's, and he's, 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 he's directly criticizing that passage. So he says, speaking of uh, Cardano says the following, speaking of the imaginative, imaginative virtue for this reason, many, um, I can't read that because it even, Okay, even if they don't want to love and are moved to love by an image of beauty presenting itself. This opinion is heretical. It is based on the compulsion of the will vis-a-vis -vis the beautiful object. The will is never carried necessarily to any object except God clearly seen and the blessedness common to everything. The will is free in regard to other objects given that it can follow or reject an object, however beautiful. Otherwise man would not be the master of his acts nor would he sin for the beloved since the beautiful thing would have simply been brought before his sight. That is heretical. For if he is impelled by necessity, the will could not have done otherwise. And so the sinning vis-a-vis -vis the beautiful object would not be imputed to the man and it would be impossible for the man to abstain from sin. 
And I think this is a very good, so I'll, uh, this, is, this is a very good um, uh, concluding remark. And it shows exactly the uh, uh, pride of place that the will has. And so, so now coming back to threat, well, what's the threat? In, in, in what, what, what is the threat of heresy? Well, the threat of heresy for, for Cardano is reduced to a kind of uh, medical, physiological, I mean, it is, um, it's the impassioned, overrun mind, uh, if you will. Uh, um, on the other hand, um, the, um, for, for the, 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 the Inquisition in the period for the censors, the threat is the, that the, the, the possibility of free will should be uh, denied, should be reduced. Um, and it's also the, that the possibility of divine justice um, should be um, denied. Um, and I think I'll stop there. There's more we could say about the, the human, the, the body and the mind in a sense for both, for both um, uh, actors. But I hope you see, this gives you a sense of how there is a clash between um, philosophy, you know, kind of quasi secular university philosophy and um, a confessional, an important confessional institution. Um, okay. On the nature of uh, of the threat, on on the threat of heresy. Uh, all right, so that's my uh, that's my conclusion. Great, thank you very much, Jonathan. Um, I sent a note asking if anybody would like to begin the discussion. To please, uh, first of all, write a brief version of your question on the chat, and then so that we can organize the discussion. But. Um, and if there's no questions, I can also keep talking about because there's a whole other uh, issue. No, I actually, I actually have a couple of questions to begin. First of all, um, given the quotations, I'm not at all surprised that um, that he got into trouble. Yeah, uh, and there's worse. There's actually. But first of all, is he deny? He, he certainly in the astrological case, is is, is does seem to be. Um, does seem to be um, espousing a kind of um, determinism, a kind of necessitarianism. Uh, does he completely deny freedom of the will, first of all? And my second question is, um, you brought up the Anabaptists, you brought up heresy. Um, obviously, this is being done in the context of the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation. Correct, yeah. And and um, the Council of Trent. Does, does Cardano distinguish mm -hmm. uh, in his account of heresy between um, the Protestant heresies and what it is that goes on in the Catholic Church? Okay, so uh, let me start with the question of astrological determinism. Um, no, he would, he, he's, I don't think at any point, I, so this is, this is, um, I would send you to one of my articles, uh, but let me try to sum it up. So, so basically he thinks that um, certainly certain worldly aspects of, uh, of Christian, if you will, civilization, militaries, uh, Christian states, their histories, um, are subject to um, astrological um, conditions. And he thinks that the astrological is always, for Cardano, essentially the natural is always corroborating the theological, if you will. And in this, he's following, I, I see him very much following this 15, this very important 1513 papal bull that is against Pompanazzi, against these sort of Paduan Averroists on the immortality of the soul, this bull that's saying, look, you philosophers need to need to be in line here on the immortality of, of the soul. Um, and Cardano writes in, in many, many places, he writes an important work on this and in, in his medical works all over the place, medical works, natural philosophical works, he's always advocating that nature and medicine, uh, physics and medicine properly understood will confirm 
not only just the immortality of the soul, but also um, a kind of resurrection. Now, why is this important for astrology? Well, I'll give you an example. So if you look at his, um, his uh, geniture of Christ, um, he goes, he, he basically says, well, Christ, because of the astro astrological conditions that were in place, Christ was given the best possible body and the best possible temperament and presumably the best possible whatever, passions, whatever. He's the best possible. But that, the astrological conditions corroborate. So in other words, a, a, a Muslim or a Jew, you know, it's this typical sort of natural theology stuff, can look at this geniture and see that Christ was the best man that's ever lived. But his divinity is not, does not follow from the astrological causes. So the divinity is beyond. And that's, it gives you an example of how he sees there is a there is a a, 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 a separation, um, but it can be very thin, and that's one of the problems. As far as his, um, so there's there's some important works um, on um, Cardano's alleged sympathy for uh, Luther, and. Um, the idea is that um, Cardano emphasizes in certain of his works. So one of the things you notice with Cardano is there's, there's this kind of split personality at times, depending on what, what kind of work he's writing. So like in some of the moral works um, or um, um, he, he, he stresses the, the, to the uncertainty of life and the uncertainty of really divine judgment um, and I, I think, I, that's what I would argue. Um, and I think certain scholars have picked up on that and said, look, that's, that's very in sympathy with, with Lutheran views on this kind of, um, the invisibility, if you will, or the alt complete transcendence of divine justice and, of, uh, 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 and, and uh, basically the choice of who's saved and who's not, salvation. And, um, so, but uh, yeah, uh, uh, that's the best I can answer your, your, your second. Great, now there are a couple of <clears throat> follow-ups. I'm gonna skip um, to a couple of people who raised questions directly related to this answer. Uh, first of all, Sean Irwin about um, uh, Pampanaz Pampanazzi. Right. Okay. Sean? Sure, and thanks. Thanks for the talk, Jonathan. Um, I'm struck by the similarity between uh, Pomponazzi's arguments in De and Mortalitate concerning uh, astrological cycles and its effect on human psychology. Right. And he runs into almost the same set of problems right. uh, with the same kinds of thing, same kinds of issues brought up against him. Um, this now, I guess I had uh, the question I stated in the chat box, but I also have a second question. Did this be this he, even these two figures, the, this um, this relationship between astrological determinism and the astrological cycles and uh, the different opinions they give rise to in human beings. This a lot of different thinkers end up showing this in the in the 16th century. They show that uh, their natural science reflects this idea. Uh, does this end up being a stock and trade sort of way that the uh, inquisitors end up going after anyone who uh, works in this field? Because it almost sounds like a template applied to Pomponazzi and to, and to what you've described today by Cardano. And then even though the two were, that Cardano was at odds with Pomponazzi, did you, um, do you see him engaged with him on this issue? So I, I don't know whether he engaged, I couldn't answer that question, whether he's engaging with, with Pomponazzi specifically on, on this issue. He get, obviously on the immortality of the soul and the, the 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 corroboration of Aristotle and Hippocrates on with with essential Catholic doctrine on the immortality of the soul he engages there with Pomponazzi, but like you pointed out, it's not an uncommon view that astrological cycles give rise to human cycles or to the rise and fall of civilizations or even religions. But I do want to point out so. Um, and then as far as later, uh, the later 
um, conflict or what will you, uh, later reception of astrology uh, amongst um, Inquisition censors. I, I can't give you a great, it's not really something I know enough about. I know the, I'm sorry, I know the Cardano case much better, but what I can tell you that might be of interest is that, and, and it's something that interested me, it's that at the beginning, he doesn't get, he doesn't get in trouble for, doesn't get in trouble, it's like, <laughs> like a child, but he doesn't get in trouble for um, doing, uh, um, for, for prognosticating. He doesn't get into trouble for making genitures. He doesn't get into trouble for sort of the stock and trade of astrology, for doing astrological uh, things. For, he gets in trouble for specifically for denying that martyrs had the choice and were assisted by God in their suffering. And for the same thing, Herod, and for naturalizing heresy for saying, hey, heretics are melancholics. They're melancholics. And that's interesting to me. And the reason is specifically because the threat of heresy as, as, it's, as a kind of um, um, a heresy as a choice, heresy as willfully subscribing to false doctrine, this is the, the sine qua non of the in institution of the, 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 the Inquisition. Without that, without that view of heresy and divine justice, they don't exist. So the threat of heresy, of course, is a, 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 a kind of institutional um, a, a reason for being. And, and that's something I kind of latched on to and I thought was really interesting. Um, yeah. So it's a really- oh, thank matter, you. Yeah, yeah thanks. Uh, Nigel Smith follow up on Protestants. Oh, yes, I, I uh, yes, thank you. That was a fascinating um, uh, talk. Um, and I just wondered if Cardano was, was in a position to distinguish as we do today between um, the, the Munster, you know, the, the kind of Anabaptists who turned up at Munster um, and, and created the commune there. Um, and, and the people we think of as more reflective and pacifistic yeah. and often with a bigger body of identifiable thought. Um, okay. so, and they, they begin to be belong with Cardano in, for instance, the doctrine of celestial flesh requires a certain amount of thinking materialistically. Um, uh, you're, you're, it's, this is a great question and I don't have uh, the faintest answer for it. Okay. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sorry about that. Uh, it's a great question. Um, uh, you know, um, so the Anabaptists, so Melanchthon is, is in, in the history of the of fanaticism, Melanchthon's important because he uses fanaticus to, to describe, uh, fanatici or whatever, to describe uh, uh, Anabaptists. Um, and um, I, this, is, this is interesting to me because, um, uh, I, you know, I'm gonna answer a, different, a totally different question if I keep going on because I, I can't answer your question. So I- You can answer the, another question, that's fine. Sure, sure. <laughs> okay, I'll answer the other question. Um, <laughs> this, this book that, uh, that I, so, so I'm, I'm really interested in this, I, this political philosopher, Dominique Cola, in, this, in the history of, the, in the genealogy of the concept of fanaticism. Um, I, I've been a big, um, I've been really interested in Melanchthon for a long time. I think he's an in, incredibly important, in a sense, political philosopher. Um, and um, how, to, how, to, how to say this about, uh, as quickly as possible. Um, so Cola, uh, basically, Cola has this reading of fanaticism as so, 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 so civil society, so early, the early modern conception of civil society and the role of the state is in part a, a, a response to um, uh, religious fracturing and religious, I don't think this is very unique or uh, this point of view, religious fracturing uh, and, 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 and fanaticism basically. So he sees fanaticism as the shadow of, of, of civil society and, and then he goes on in that book to write about uh, uh, 
you know, modern terrorism and things like this. And, and so that's, that was my, that was my interest there in Manesson and Anabaptist, just to kind of point out that this argument about the nature of heresy is actually um, seems to be really to resonate with, to somehow be connected to um, very important questions about um, the role of the state and the role of experts within, within the state. Uh, if you will, um, so state yeah. power and state expertise. And I'm not exactly I, sure. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. I'm actually thinking that we should move on because there are a few other questions, people. Thanks for the question. That's OK. okay. Um, uh, Pietro Daniel Omodeo and uh, Anna Marie um, Roos had questions that are connected. So why don't you both put them on the table at the same yeah. time? Thank you, Jonathan. Um, so my, my curiosity concerns the idea of threat. So the, the underlining question of your talk and your research. Do you see that as an individual problem? So something informing Cardano science or a more general political question of the time? Uh, two words on this. So if I understand you well, threat is something that um, informs Cardano science, you know, his astrology, his medicine, his mathematics, I mean, the statistics as ways to cope with you know, uncertainty and danger and so on. On the other hand, we can see that as a sort of answer to, to the feeling that I would say is connected with threat, that is fear. And we know that fear is a political passion. And I mean, thinking from Hobbes up to, um, up to Montesquieu. So I'd like to see how you see, you know, the scientific individual philosophical question in connection with the more general question about threat and fear in the time of Cardano. Okay, so Cardano. Uh, and there's, Anna, just a moment, Anna Marie uh, Ruth, excuse me. Here. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Um, I'm actually also very interested to know, is this interest in threat, why Cardano was really obsessed with probabilities. And I'm thinking of the De Prudentia Eximia and Decision Theory and Divinatory Sciences, which he wrote towards the end of its life. I mean, it's not full-blown de moi probability of chances, but it does remind me a little bit of a philosophical fruit machine when he was trying to figure out um, what his fate was going to be. And I wondered if you thought about that when you were trying to Think about Cardano and threat. So, so let me start from this. From so, thanks very much for uh, for the two questions, Anna and, and Pietro. Um, I'll start with the second one, which is yes, I think there's a there's a definitely a connection. I'm not sure, and I can articulate it any better than you have, though. And it's something I want to work on. And it's I want to work on. I also want to work. So I'll be in Venice. I want to work a little bit on 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 uh, you know actually risk and a little bit on risk and merchant trade and things like this, you know, uh, if I can. But, uh, but yeah, so, and for, so Pietro, um, interesting, um, in the works I know of Cardano, and there's a lot I don't know, but in the works that I do know, it's, the, the interest is always on the individual, how the individual navigates various threats and social, professional, astrological. Um, it's a very individualistic view, I'd say. But if you look at somebody like Melanchthon and you want to talk about his political philosophy as a response to his threats um, toward that very clear and present threats that he sees both within and without the, uh, the movement, um, it's collective, I would say. Um, and um, yeah, so that's the quick answer. So I mean, yeah. I'm sorry, are you finished? Yeah, I'm done. Yeah. Um, Gregory Todd. Yeah, I just had a very different kind of question, a kind of simple-minded question, which may not be something you really much looked at. And that's just the reception or the even the knowledge of the Inquisition proceedings against Cardano in the rest of Europe uh, either with sort of a later on Pascal type French group or, or in Britain uh, as something that would later feed into the idea that the priests are never to be trusted and miracles are not to be believed. Um, so, um, so, oh, I hear um, thanks for that question. I, uh, I don't know. Um, as far as I know, Cardano's, based on the, the little I, I do, I can say, I mean, Kind of anecdotally, you know, I, I don't think his trial was very well known at all. He actually doesn't even, he doesn't discuss it 
at all, really. He discussed in his, uh, you know, he writes an autobiography. Uh, um, and it's a very, it's an incredible and important literary work uh, of the 16th century. Um, in that, in, in his autobiography, he just, he alludes to his imprisonment. He doesn't say why. Um, I would say, again, just anecdotally, my experience, like Bruno, later on, Bruno's trial was much better than, much better than, than, than Cardano's. Cardano's was kind of hush, hush, hush a little bit. The, in the trial documents, um, the Inquisitor basically sends these memos every now, quite, quite frequently actually, to um, his boss in Rome. And you can see he's, he's very, um, he's trying to be as delicate as possible with the fame of, of Cardano. And he worries specifically about ruining Cardano's reputation or enough that Cardano becomes, and I quote, because of Cardano's literary ability and philosophical ability, he worries that Cardano will become, quote unquote, a really dangerous instrument of the devil. I mean, that's basically what he says. So it's, he's also has to be a little careful with, he's, he, you could see him being careful with Cardano's fame. They obviously didn't worry about that with Bruno. No, Bruno is a totally different and much more tragic case, yeah. Um, last question, Bill Eaton. Oh, I, my question was, was really just uh, concerning uh, his view on the influence of uh, love and, and, and grief and, and whether uh, it just doesn't seem like that's a complete denial of, uh, of, of free will. Um, so I just wanted to know what you, you thought. Oh, I don't, I don't think it's a complete denial either. I don't think it's a complete well, it's denial. A bad, it's He's a just, <laughs> Cardano gets into a vein. He'll start writing in a vein. He'll start, and he just, he'll kind of, um, he, he wrote very quickly. And, and I think, you know, he's not always super clear and careful. Obvious, I don't think he denies free will at all. But in that, in that book of De Subtilitate. Like some kind of finite influence. Um, yeah, it's finite. He cares, he's a physician. He's overridden, maybe. Yeah, and he cares about natural causes and this and that. And, and it's within a whole discussion of the importance basically of, of blood, menstrual blood, humors. Um, there's a, a, a discussion on the physiology of the male sexual response and some advice. And I mean, it's all over the board, but the emphasis is on the, the human as a kind of, basically a kind of pneumatic um, network of spirit, of, of heat. Uh, so you know, spirit and heat, if you will. Yeah. Just fascinating stuff. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. We do have one last question. Um, Dennis, can you be uh, quick? Uh, sure. Uh, you've been talking about uh, some aspects of uh, Cardano and passions, but is there, does he have a detailed theory of the passions that he expounds? This is the definition of this passion, this is the definition of this passion, and it uh, is, uh, or it's only found within uh, medical works where it's related to how it's caused by various humors, or yes, many can, pieces yeah. of humors, or is, or is there a separate place where he treats these? Yeah, there's a separate, there's a separate place. He, he has basically moral works where he discusses the passions, and I point you to, to start with uh, Guido Giglioni's work on tranquility and the passions in, in Cardano. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Well, thank you very much. Let's all turn on our microphones and um, thank, thank Jonathan. <laughs> um, thank and you, now man. we're going to move on to the um, second presentation. Uh, David McComish of Venetia Network and the Reform of Education in Early Modern Edinburgh. The case of Patrick Sands and his Paduan Circle. David? Thank you. Um, I'll try and share screen here as well, if that's okay. Um, if I else. PowerPoint. I don't know if that's worked, has it now? 
It's not on yet. No. Uh, second, try again. You should have a little green square at the bottom. Yeah, I'm on this. It's um, it's coming up desktop one whiteboard Microsoft PowerPoint unknown advanced files. Um, now let's try that share. Open system preferences. I think I've got a security thing which is stopping it from being shared. Right. Why not try hitting just the top left screen? Okay. Sorry about this. Um. And the PowerPoint's up, it's not coming up on Zoom, unfortunately. Desktop, and again, it's coming up open system preferences. And Do you have a Mac? Yes. You don't have to restart Zoom, you just have to give it permission uh, in system preferences, uh -huh. it'll open up the system preferences. Just give it permission, and then that, and then go back to Zoom, and and that should work in View, or excuse me, and uh, start share and under Meeting. Um, Zoom will not be able to record the contents of your screen until it is quit. It, it doesn't matter. You don't need to record it. Okay, so just what quit now? As or? long as it's clicked and selected. Uh -huh. uh, then click and select so it's good and then go back to zoom and go into meeting and then go to uh, start share that should work right yes excellent thank you jonathan um right um, can you see the full screen here? Is it all the different slides? So I'll put it onto a slideshow, perhaps. Um, is that full screen? Yes. Yes, excellent. Yes. Thanks very much. Um, sorry about that. Okay, um, when uh, Jonathan and I were first exchanging emails about what our uh, presentations shared in common, um, we suggested that uh, threat um, is something that we both shared, but after having listened to Jonathan's talk, <laughs> it's, it's clear that this is only going to be the most superficial interaction with the concept of threat. In the background, you'll probably detect every now and then a battle between Palatine authority and bottom-up religious authority, which um, is perceived as threat by some of the interlocutors in, in, in the discussion um, that's about to come here, but it's only at the most superficial level. And at a simple level, this talk is really about a group of individuals, a group of friends and family, um, and uh, provisional examination of their activities in relation to education, um, specifically education, um, astronomical education, metaphysical education, mathematical education, and formal education in Edinburgh and um, in Europe as a whole. And there'll be some, again, fairly provisional and fairly superficial um, discussions um, of the significance of these activities uh, for our understanding of the importation and exportation of the history of, uh, of ideas um, in the 16th and 17th century. Um, a, a more fundamental level, um, 
it's an introductory discussion of a project which is going to be undertaken at Kafoskri over the next couple of years, which is essentially an excavation of the foundations and parameters of uh, a pathway, a fairly recognisable pathway of knowledge exchange, which stretches from Edinburgh to Denmark, down into Rostock, through Helmstedt in northern Germany, down into to Venice and to the Republic of Venice and Padua. Um, and as I said, uh, sort of provisional evaluation of the significance of this particular network. So it'll be plotting these particular points by looking at the activities of a series of individuals and spread across uh, roughly a 25 year period. But the significance of their activities, I argue and hopefully show to a certain extent, extends beyond that 25 year period where this closely knit group of friends and family um, are, are, are working. Now, in the first slide here, I've given a sort of visual introduction to the temporal framework um, that we're working within and also the geographical focus um, as well. And it'll introduce you to some of the names. Now, I could drop a lot of names in this discussion and I don't want it to detract from the sort of central argument that I'm trying to make. I'm trying to delineate this sort of fertile crescent of, of knowledge exchange that goes from Edinburgh through um, um, the Denmark to Northern Germany and down into Italy. So I don't want to burden you with too many names, which will break down the narrative slightly. But I'll introduce a couple of names just now that you'll hear repeated um, as we go on. Um, and it will also anchor the, the, the talk more generally in its sort of temporal framework. Uh, those of you who are familiar with the, the physical fabric of the University of Padua, the center of academic activity in the Venetian Republic in the late medieval, early modern period. We we'll recognize probably some of the frescoes here. These are from the inside of the Palazzo Bo, which is the center of the, the academic center of the University of Padua. Um, inside the Palazzo Bo are two um, loggia two peristyles which have vaults, two levels, sorry, two levels of peristyles which have vaults and onto the vaults are painted the coat of arms and names of students um, and academic administrators from within the student body who attended the University of Padua in the late medieval and, and, and early modern period. Um, and as you walk into the Palazzo Bo underneath the line of St Mark into the courtyard. The first um, fresco that you'll see as you look up is the one on your left hand side, Scota Patiicio Sandicio Scotus. And that's a slight misspelling of someone's names. It should be Patricius Sandicius. And this is Patrick Sands, um, who is in the first graduating class of the University of the then new University of Edinburgh in 1587. It's founded by King James by royal decree. It's a, a secular and civic institution, the University of Edinburgh, the first um, non ecclesiastical foundation of a university in Scotland. It's founded by King James, while he's still in his minority. Patrick Sands graduates in the first class in 1587 um, and uh, he's quite a bright spark and he's given a job upon graduation as a tutor, a regent at the University of Edinburgh and after uh, a very short time doing that he leaves Edinburgh and heads down to the Venetian Republic um, where he meets one of his fellow students um, from Edinburgh who's in one of the first classes at Edinburgh University, one Thomas Seggett. And thanks to um, Thomas Seggett's album Amicorum, some of you will be familiar with Thomas Seggett's name, various individuals have done work on him over the years, Edward Rosen, most recently Stefano Gattai on the album Amicorum. Thanks to Patrick Sands' entry in the album Amicorum, um, which is written in uh, Padua. Um, uh, in the later part of the 16th century. We know that Patrick Sands and Thomas Seggett are very good friends when they're at Edinburgh. And as Patrick Sands, Sands says in his entry in the album on the Corum, they become even greater friends uh, over the period of time that Patrick Sands is in the Venetian Republic. He's there for roughly four years. Thomas Seggett is part of Galileo's inner circle of uh, friends and acquaintances, and also uh, Gian, Vincenzo, Gian Vincenzo Pinelli as well, of, uh, the library 
fame. So Patrick Sands is very much part of this group of individuals in the later part of the 16th century in Padua. Um, on the other side, on the right hand side, is a fresco from the second level of the Palazzo Bo, and this is above the entrance into the Aula Magna, which is the main lecture theatre um, at the University of Padua. It's now given over as a sort of shrine to Galileo, who delivered a lot of his lectures in here when he was chair of mathematics for many years at the University of Padua. And I think we're I'm not sure if the tile of faces here is, is over the name that I actually want you to see, but on the right hand side, the extreme right hand side, you can see there's Scota at the top and underneath it, it said Johannes Cragius Scotus, uh, John Craig Scott. I'm going to mention John Craig's name a couple of times, but there are actually two different John Craigs. So I'm going to refer to one of them as John Craig Jr. and, and John Craig Sr. This is John Craig Jr. Um, who's known in his own right for being a physician to King James and is at King James's bedside in 1625 when King James uh, dies and famously has a, 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 a something of a boxing match over the dying king's body with one of the English courtiers and both of them have to be removed from the room. So that's this particular John Craig and he matriculates at the University of Padua in 1608 bro. Uh, up to 1611, I think it is. So he's there for a few years. So this is from the 17th century. So we've got a period here of the 1590s through to the 1610s, a period of roughly 20 years. And, and Craig and Sands are known to each other. They're, they're friends as well. So they sort of bookmarking either side of the period that we're going to be looking at. But we're, go we're not going to start from Patrick Sands um, matriculation at the University of Padua. I'm going to trace this particular network's activities and the significance of the activities as we go forward to a particular point in time, to 1589, to a particular occasion, uh, the marriage of King James VI of Scotland, as was then, um, he would become just over a decade later, King James I of England, um, to Anne of Denmark, and in 1589, mid 1589, the marriage, the initial marriage would take place by proxy. Uh, King James sent to Denmark the Earl Marshal, who went out with a group of, I hesitate to use the name, no, to use the word nobles. I mean, they certainly wouldn't have described themselves as that. There are certainly some nobles there, but there's a whole host of different individuals that go out, lawyers, schoolmasters, academics. Um, we know of some of them from poetry that survives. We know some of the nobility from specific decrees that King James makes, but there's also epistolary evidence as well of some of the individuals that go out to, to Denmark um, and join the party with the Earl Marshal um, for the proxy marriage. On the left-hand side here, we have um, an extract from one of the letters of John Craig Sr. Many people will, will be familiar with John Craig Sr., more familiar with John Craig Sr. Than, than John Craig Jr. A lot of work has been done on John Craig Sr. over the years. And I would imagine a lot of people will be familiar with him from Owen Gingrich's work on the copies of Copernicus, first and second edition copies of Copernicus's De Revolutionibus. John Craig flits in and out of Gingrich's accounts. Um, there's a 1566 second edition of John Craig's um, that, that John Craig owns of Copernicus's De Revolutionibus, and it's quite important for the history of mathematics. I can't really go into it just now. Adam Mosley has written a bit about the epistolary battle that Tycho Brahe had with John Craig over the superlunary or not, as John Craig initially argued, nature of the comets that appeared in the sky in 1572 and 1570. So, well, 1577, one of them was a supernova, of, of course. Um, and this is an extract from one of those letters, this is from the Dryer edition from 1903, and um, this is an extract from one of those letters um, in which John Craig is arguing with Tycho Brahe, but towards the end of the letter um, he says that coming out for the upcoming wedding of His Majesty um, is a group of individuals, would you be kind enough to welcome to them to your home? There's a few people named there, but I'm going to focus in on Thomas Nicholsonius. Um, Magister, or sorry, Philosophiae Magister, uh, referring to his recent graduation from the University of, Thomas Nicholson, referring to his recent graduation from the University of Glasgow in, in 1585. Um, Thomas Nicholson, um, 
after this wedding, we next see him a few months after the celebration has finished. He moves from Rostock um, and uh, attends a dinner held by Heinrich Julius, um, the uh, Duke of Brunswick and uh, Rector of Helmstead University. And where he's given a gold chain and, and various other trinkets. And from there, he makes his way down to the University of Padua, where he matriculates in 1591 with two other Scots, Walter Scott, uh, Duke of Buccleuch, and one William Fowler. And you can actually see William Fowler's name in the postscript. John Craig has said, incidentally, there's to Tycho Brahe, incidentally, there's another person that will be coming out to join uh, the party as well, one William S. Fullerus. Now I've looked at these letters over the last few years and I really had no idea who this Williamus Fullerus was, but I recently read for the first time, inexplicably because it's been out for a few years, um, Alessandra Pretina, who's professor of English literature at the University of Padua, um, wrote an article on Walter Scott of Buccleuch one of the individuals that matriculates at Padua with Thomas Nicholson. Um, and she identified this William as Fuller's as uh, William Fowler, um, one of King James's spies and courtiers, also a moneylender, and the uncle of the famous Jacobean poet William Drummond of Hawthorne Den. Um, William Fowler, um, as you look through the bra letters, is used as a courier by John Craig to take letters to and from various individuals that um, John Craig is in epistolary contact with. One of them is Duncan Liddell. You can actually see Duncan Liddell's named in the next letter, which is from a few months later. Um, and there's no note of when Thomas Nicholson and William Fowler went to Heinrich Julius's banquet. Uh, if he met Duncan Liddell, we don't know if that happened at this particular point. It's probable. We'll go on to look at the circumstances to suggest that it is probable um, because Nicholson and Lick will become quite close um, and uh, are really key to some of the educational reforms that go on. So it's probable that Thomas Nicholson met Duncan Little at this time. Duncan Little moves from Rostock um, in 1590 down to Helmstead University, of which Henry Julius is the rector and is a professor of mathematics at Helmstead for many years after that, from 1591 onwards. So this is probably the, the genesis of the relationship that we see between Thomas Nicholson and um, Duncan Liddell. Uh, and this is also the genesis of this arc that I'm trying to argue is a fairly significant route and, and, and pathway of knowledge exchange from Edinburgh down into the Venetian Republic and back again uh, as well, because after Thomas Nicholson, there, for a period, almost an unbroken period of 25 years, Scots make their way from Edinburgh primarily, but also from Aberdeen as well, down through this particular route. Uh, Gilbert Gray is one of them. I managed to discover this while re re uh, reading Pietro Amadeus and Karen Friedrich's excellent book from 2016 on Duncan Little, which Jonathan, I'm fairly sure, contributed to as well. Um, and uh, Gilbert Gray uh, is an individual who stopped off with uh, Duncan Little and uh, stayed there for a year um, and then went down to Padua as well and is, is in the year above Thomas Nicholson. Padua. Gilbert Gray is a very interesting individual because he becomes part of a, a, an educational, educational enterprise which the Earl Marshal, the person that led the initial wedding party in 1589 and also, who also went down into the lands of the electors and princes and perhaps met Heinrich Julius as well uh, at this particular time. Um, Regardless, um, he returns to Aberdeen and starts a university of his own, Marshall College, named after himself, the Earl Marshall. And Gilbert Gray becomes one of the first principals of Marshall College Aberdeen, one of the longest serving principals in the early years of Marshall College Aberdeen until his death in 1614. Uh, Duncan Liddell himself becomes one of the early, very important benefactors of Marshall College. Uh, as well. Again, there's no direct evidence linking Duncan Liddell 
uh, to the Earl Marshal from this early period that I found anyway, but if anyone else has come across anything, it would be, it would be great to know. Um, but, but regardless, Duncan Ludlow becomes one of the early, earliest benefactors. He leaves a significant amount of land in Pitt Maiden uh, for the use of the college to build buildings on. He leaves a significant amount of money for poor students uh, enrolling in Marshall College bursaries. And perhaps most significantly, he leaves a significant amount of money for the installation of a new chair of mathematics, the Duncan Little Chair of Mathematics, the first chair of mathematics in any of the Scottish ancient universities. Um, and Duncan Little dies in 1613. The person that Duncan Little names as his main executor of his will, along with his brother, John Little, is Thomas Nicholson. And this is where we get back to Thomas Nicholson being in Helmstead and perhaps that's being the genesis of the relationship because Thomas Nicholson really takes over uh, the implementation process of the bursary, of the allocation of the, the lands for Duncan Little, the setting up of a memorial to Duncan Little, and also it becomes the main overseer of the installation of the chair of mathematics as well. Um, we know from the correspondence between Thomas Nicholson and the city council of Aberdeen, because Marshall College is a civic installation, and although the Earl Marshall is the, 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 the uses his network to start up the university, it is still a civic institution, and the town council have ultimate responsibility for it. So there's a series of letters from the town council and some of the main uh, protagonists and and the the, the the start of Marshall College that survive, and uh, we know from these letters that Duncan Little gave his chest of possessions and the key to his chest of possessions over to Thomas Nicholson, who holds all of them in his house in Edinburgh. So Thomas Nicholson is the person that, that runs the entire show. But Thomas Nicholson does have um, one person who he, with whom he, he works exclusively. And again, we know this from the letters to Aberdeen Town Council, where he says that he will do nothing in any of the affairs to do with the installation of the college buildings in Pitt Medden, or the installation of the chair of mathematics or the student bursaries without the express help of Alexander Kim. And you'll see in your left hand side there's actually a book that we managed to find at Edinburgh this year that was owned by Thomas Nicholson. You can see his signature on the right hand side about halfway up. Um, and it was originally owned by Alexander King as well. It says Liber Alexander King. Um, at, at the bottom. So they were very good friends and we found many of these books now were the books that we shared between each other. Um, Alexander King is given responsibility to help search for a new um, head of mathematics. Although Alexander King is essentially a lawyer, he has no um, administrative in an academic context experience at all. He has no experience of working um, in mathematics at a university either. However, he does have a younger brother who is also his best friend as well, as we'll see in a second. And his younger brother was the chair of mathematics at the University of Paris for 20 years. His name is Adam King. Um, and we'll speak a lot more about him as, as, uh, towards the end of the talk and uh, as we progress. And um, that's a portrait in the, mid in the middle, incidentally, of the Earl Marshall. Um, it's not Thomas Nicholson or Alexander King. Um, at the same time that Alex Alexander King and Thomas Nicholson are looking for a chair of mathematics, Gilbert Gray dies um, and Earl Marshall has to find a new principal for Marshall College. You've got these two appointments which are moving side by side. Now, we Because the Earl Marshall is using his patronage network um, to appoint the chair and uh, the principal, we don't really know the mechanism because the town council are kind of kept out of the loop, the mechanism by which the appointments are made. What we do know though, is that the Earl Marshall chooses uh, as the principal of Marshall College, Patrick Sands, the Patrick Sands who went to Edinburgh in the 15, uh, who, who was in the first class that graduated from Edinburgh in 1587 and went to Padua and was there in the 1590s with Thomas Nicholson. Um, and at exactly the same time, not in 1613 when Little dies, they actually wait until the new principal has been set up before the chair of mathematics is initialised. And the implication is that the chair will be established by the principal once the principal starts up. 
Um, Thomas Nichols and Alexander King put forward a name for consideration by the Earl Marshal, and the name is one William Craig, no relation to John Craig, um, who replaced Patrick Sands as regent at Edinburgh. It's actually Patrick Sands' um, very good family friend, um, Patrick Sands' family and the, the Craig family, William Craig's family, are, are very, very close. So we can imagine that the the choice of William Craig has something to do with Patrick Sands as well, although we have no record that he had any input in, in it at all. We have feedback um, in letters from the town council, from ministers within the town council, specifically an individual called um, Thomas Copeland, about the choice of Patrick Sands as minister. And more or less quoting verbatim here, Thomas Copeland says that Patrick Sands I have heard is well versed in philosophy and mathematics, but as far as I can tell, this man knows nothing about the word of God and should not be put in charge of the care of so many souls in education. This is really the last that we hear about Patrick Sands and William Craig in this context because the, pro the, the process is discontinued. Um, and then about six months later, another individual selected for the principalship of Marshall College. Um, and we have a letter from Thomas Copeland saying, oh, this man is this man is well versed in the word of God and I'm very happy with your appointment. Now, we don't know whether Sands refused to take the principalship or whether he was deselected because of the pressure that was being put upon the town council from the ministers uh, who were advising in, in this affair. Thomas Copeland um, was fairly unpleasant towards the provost of Aberdeen um, and pointedly threatened uh, to withdraw funds and support um, and actively rally against the appointment of Patrick Sands. So we don't know whether Patrick Sands just refused it or whether he was um, forbidden, but he doesn't come in, the new principal comes in, and we hear nothing again about the chair of mathematics for well over a decade. It's, 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 it's kicked into the long grass and we hear nothing about it again. However, um, at more or less the same time, from the period of 1614 through to 1620, exactly the same individuals minus the Earl Marshal, who's taking care of his own college and has other responsibilities as well, um, begin to make similar moves in Edinburgh. Um, a central character here, you can see in the central pal panel here, is David Aikenhead. This man will become the provost um, in 1619 of Edinburgh Town Council. Um, he is a pointedly secularist, um, almost antithetical individual to, to the church ministers, um, whether that's to the religious institution or it's in a confessional sense, the Calvinism, we don't know. But what we do know is that when he takes over uh, the town council, he updates some of the um, provisions which have been made for the establishment of Edinburgh University, which, as I said at the very start, is a 1583 um, establishment by King James. Um, King James was under the authority, um, or under the influence, rather, of the Protestant lords, really, at this time still, and one of the stipulations of the charter for the establishment of Edinburgh University was that the principal shall always be a minister of the Church of Scotland. David Aitkenhead revises um, this provision and says that the principal of the college shall only be a minister if the town council decrees that that is appropriate. Within three months of David Aitkenhead becoming provost of the University of Edinburgh, he begins proceeding to demit from office Henry Charteris, the principal, uh, the then principal of the University of Edinburgh. He gives the reason for the process of demission as that Henry Charteris can't perform the duties of principal of a great institution like Edinburgh and be a minister of the cloth at the same time. Henry Charteris is deselected and Patrick Sands is installed as the principal of the University of Edinburgh. Um, in 1620 by David Aikenhead, who is Patrick Sands' brother-in-law. So it's easy to see it as some 
Presbyterian historians of the latter 17th century, it's easy to present this as a case of nepotism, where brother-in-law has put um, an individual in place. Um, but if we actually look at the lead up to the appointment of Patrick Sands, we can see it's part of a coherent educational reform that involves various individuals and all of them recognisable from the reforms which tried to be pushed through at Marshall College. Um, in 1612, um, while Thomas Nicholson, Duncan Liddell, um, and Alexander King are um, liaising with Earl Marshall over the reform at uh, Marshall College. The students of the University of Edinburgh graduate in July. You can see on your left hand side here is a, a published edition of the Theses Philosophicae, the student disputations which are given at graduation ceremonies for every four year class at the University of Edinburgh. Um, and there's also always a, a a guest of honour or guests of honour uh, that stand up in the days and the students address their uh, theses to them. For the year 1612, um, you can see here Alexandro Reggio et um, Adamo Reggio are the guests of honour. Alexander King and his younger brother Adam King are the guests of honour here. At this time as well, Adam King has been commissioned by uh, King James along with Patrick Sands uh, to find new Scots grammar and Latin grammar to be used in schools throughout the land. It's commissioned by an act of the Scottish Parliament, so it's a, it's a, it's a royal commission. And Patrick Sands and, and Adam King are set up, uh, are installed as the, as the head of this commission. At the same time, Adam King begins writing a 160,000 word cosmological commentary um, which Patrick Sands writes the foreword to, uh, and in the foreword Patrick Sands says that this commentary will be used in the classroom, uh, tertiary education, it will be used in the classroom. He, he doesn't stipulate which particular classroom, but we'll go on to that in a second because we know which particular classroom it actually was. So this is the lead up to Sands' appointment from 1612 through to 1616, 1617. There's a series of educational commissions that are set up, the Royal Commissions and Sands and King is involved in them. Um, and also individuals uh, related to Sands and King. I should have said that David Aitkenhead is also the legal guardian of Adam King's children. I have no idea why, I've not been able to find a particular relationship for them, but it's clearly a very strong relationship between King and Aitkenhead. Uh, Aitkenhead is also initiating um, moves within the town council to facilitate um, uh, Patrick Sands becoming principal as well. Um, Patrick Sands' first act, and we, we, I suppose we're not really surprised by this given what happens at Marshall College. Patrick Sands' first act as principal of the University of Edinburgh is to create a chair of mathematics. It's the first chair of mathematics of any of the Scottish universities. It's the first one that's um, set up at Edinburgh as well, of course. Um, Patrick Sands chooses one Andrew Young, his friend, uh, Andrew Young, if any of you are familiar with Andrew Young, you're probably familiar with him from um, John Napier's Descriptio Canonis Mirifici of 1614, the first publication of the Wondrous Canon of Logarithms, where Patrick Sands and Andrew Young write the prefatory material um, to the, uh, the Wondrous Canon. They also write all the prefatory material to the 1617 uh, Rhabdologiae, Napier's Bones as well. It's only Sands and only Young uh, that, that write the foreword to that as well. Sands and Young are a good friends with John Napier and Napier is, is part of this circle of friends, including Adam King as well. Now, on your right hand side, you can just about see it. There's a little big initial with a, a bearded chap using a cross staff looking up to the skies and a little globe and then a building behind it as well. This is from the student dictates from the 17th century in Edinburgh, as well as having uh, one of the best sets of theses philosophicae from any of the Scottish universities in the 17th century at Edinburgh, also have uh, the most voluminous compendium of student dictates, that is lecture notes from inside the classroom themselves that are survived, and this is from the student dictates. Um, in 1617, Adam, uh, uh, Andrew Young, 
the chair of mathematics that Patrick Sands has chosen, leaves his Scopi Astronomici to the university for the public use of students. And it includes, it includes his Radius Astronomicus, his cross staff, um, and other uh, heaven divining instruments. Um, at the same time, um, two weeks after this, uh, bequeathed to the town council, is the great quadrant of John Napier, which John Napier has ordered to be brought back from London. He, he'd loaned it to Henry Briggs um, and Henry Briggs brings it back and it's set up in the forecourt of the new uh, buildings of the university. And that's what you can actually see there. Now this is either, either a celestial globe um, or it's the quadrant just very poorly <laughs> drawn. Um, the building in the background is the 1617 building. You can actually see a, a picture of it from the 19th century before it was demolished to make way for the Playfair Library. Those of you that are familiar from, with Edinburgh will know that Robert Adam designed Playfair old college building. Um, this was built over the top of the 1617 building at Edinburgh. Um, what's interesting about the 1617 building is that Edinburgh City Council set up to uh, um, legal advisors known as assessors that would become for the next 10 years the, the city council's chief advisors on academic matters um, and they, the, the advisors, the assessors were Thomas Nicholson and Alexander King and they were to procure money for the building of new estates and they procured money from Walter Scott, Duke of Buccleuch and his estate for the building of the 1617 library. Walter Scott, Duke of Buccleuch matriculated in the same year at Padua with um, Thomas Nicholson um, as well. So the physical fabric um, and the academic reformation at Edinburgh, the, the Padawan circle are heavily involved in it. Now, thanks to the survival of the 160,000 word cosmological commentary that I mentioned earlier, we have some fairly incredible evidence of the reformation of the curriculum at the University of Edinburgh at this time. And this is where I'll sort of tentatively touch on um, the ideas that are moving across this particular network. And um, because we do very much get a picture of the ideas which are coming, especially from the northern part, from Helmstedt, from Denmark, and also from the southern part as well. We have it in manuscript form here, but we also have it in, 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 in book form and bibliographic form as well. I'll go into evidence of that. But headline figure, these three different things which you have in front of you. On your right hand side you can see Orto et Ocaso, uh, Ocaso Astronomico, and these are student dictates from the 17th century. At the bottom you have Theses Astronomicae, these are the published student Theses Philosophicae from the, 16th, uh, from the 17th century. And in the top right hand corner is an extract from Adam King's 160,000 word commentary. And one of the things that we've able to determine after roughly five years of fairly intensive work on the Adam King document is that the thesis Astronomicae et Physicae, that's the thesis Philosophicae, and the student dictates for the classes 1612, 1616, 1616, 1620, 1620, 1624, 24, 28, 28, 32. The plague then comes to Edinburgh and um, echoes of our own age. All classes are abandoned and there's no public disputations allowed. However, the classes are still held in private and the student dictates continue. So we've got the student dictates for 1632, 36, 36, 40, 40, 44. All of those, the dictates and the thesis are verbatim sections taken from the Adam King manuscript. So the manuscript is being used in the first instance in the classroom for lectures in philosophy, in natural philosophy, in astronomy and in mathematics. And it is ubiquitous and it's everywhere and it's verbatim and it's non-paraphrased. And the Theses Philosophicae are just slightly abridged forms of this, but again, they are verbatim. It's unsyncopated, uh, sorry, it's, 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 it's verbatim, yeah, it's not paraphrased. Um, it is all taken from the Adam King manuscript. Um, which is fairly incredible in itself, but it's, it's wonderful because Adam King quotes and cites and references in detail 
all of the arguments that you would expect to see from someone who's part of a circle of individuals who have connections to Denmark, Rostock, Helmstedt, and the Republic of Venice. And that for one of the key concerns early on in the manuscript for Adam King is establishing that the comets that appeared in the sky in 1572, 1577, 1585, and 1604 were superlunary. Um, and he gives all of the evidence from various individuals, from Kepler for, from 1604, from Tycho Brahe and Christoph Clavius from 72 and 77. He also cites Cardano as well in his work on uh, the, the comets. And he comes to the conclusion that indeed the, the, the Ptolemaic, sol the Aristotelian solid celestial spheres um, are unsustainable and should be completely and utterly rejected. And we now need to move on to something else. We need to find out exactly what's happening in the heavens. And this is where we now move down to Padua and we have a series of texts that are coming out of the Republic of Venice. Uh, Francesco Patrizzi, Gian Battista Benedetti, Bernardino Talesio, um, Galileo, um, most of them on motion in some way or some form, impetus to motion, what is impetus to motion if we take the prime mover out of it, what's actually happening in the heavens. So we have all of these texts quoted verbatim and cited in the Adam King manuscript uh, as well. One of the really interesting parts is how close to the publication, not the publication, the finishing of the manuscript in 1616, that must be when King stops. A lot of the texts that he's citing in the text are, for example, he, he, he quotes and cites extensively Christoph Scheiner's Mathematical Disquisitions, which are published, of course, in 1615. He, he names Christoph Scheiner, incidentally, he doesn't say George Locker. Um, uh, he knows that it's Christoph Scheiner that's, that's published the Mathematical Disquisitions on diurnal motion of the uh, Earth in a, over a 24-hour period. He goes into a, a discourse on that. He, Starry Messenger is one of the most quoted texts um, in the manuscript. Johannes Kepler's um, commentary on Starry Messenger is also quoted. Johannes Kepler's unpublished Somnium as well, which doesn't come out until I think 1630 or something like that, is quoted in the text as well. Now, it doesn't say in the manuscript that I'm getting all this information from Patrick Sands and Patrick Sands is getting all this information from Thomas Saget, but we, we, we may imagine, especially when it comes to the Shiner material, the Kepler material, given Thomas Saget's close relationship with Johannes Kepler at this time. He, he's living with Johannes Kepler not long after 1610 on the recommendation of Galileo. And given his closeness to Galileo as well, a lot of this very, very early stuff must be coming through the sans Seget uh, stream. Regardless, they're finding their way into the manuscript. Uh, the books are coming from the Venetian Republic and the Frankfurt uh, Book Fair as well. We have some library lists here. I don't have time really to go into them. But on the right, the left-hand side, Williamus Week. Um, these are all actually Adam King's books. Um, Talesio's book is in there as well. Adam King owned that. Uh, Adam King returned to Edinburgh from Paris in the late 16th century. So his connections with Venice and the Venetian Republic must ultimately come through Patrick Sands, um, who is Adam King's close friends. On the right hand side is James Douglas of Whittingham's donation of 100 mathematical books. One thing we've been able to find out over the last year um, at Edinburgh is that these are all John Craig's books. This is John Craig Senior's library. That's how the 1566 John Craig Copernicus book came into the University of Edinburgh Library. It was James Douglas of Whittingham who was the secretary to King James the first of England, King James the sixth of Scotland. He brought them back to Edinburgh and gave them to the University of Edinburgh to use. So anyway, I'm kind of rambling now because I'm coming to the wards the end of this, but this is kind of what my project at Carfoscary or the project that we'll be looking at Carfoscary over the next couple of years is going to be focused on the manuscript. The manuscript's relationship to the thesis Philosophicae. There's a screenshot there of all of the digitized theses, which we have nearly an unbroken um, 40 years and then it breaks for the disruption and then it starts again in the later uh, 17th century. 
um, and the relationship between these theses and all of the different texts which are cited in the Adam King manuscript and all of the different nodes in this particular network um, and how these ideas come into the University of Edinburgh. And I'll, I'll just finish by articulating one final thing, which is a sort of tentative assumption once we realize the significance of the, these individuals and of the manuscript, we try to map forward how much it influenced what happened in the latter part of the 17th century. And Patrick Sands um, selects uh, one Thomas Crawford as professor of mathematics in the earlier part of the 17th century. Crawford becomes the longest serving professor of mathematics and uses this particular manuscript. Um, the Adam King manuscript. He becomes the longest serving professor of mathematics and is in situ um, in the 1660s when Gregory and Pitcairn and all of these individuals are coming into Edinburgh as well. So we're interested in trying to map beyond the project, you know, how much of an influence these guys actually have uh, going forward into the, the latter part of the 17th century. I'll stop there. It's uh, been on for a bit too long, I think. Thank you, thank you very, very much. Um, as before, um, if anybody has any questions, please um, uh, send me a note on the chat and, and I'll recognize you. Um, let me begin with one question about, um, this is absolutely fascinating. First of all, the question is, um, why Venice <clears throat> of all the universities that one could have been connected with? Why is it that Venice was the one that um, um, Edinburgh um, was connected with? Mm -hmm. And second of all, about the list of characters, Copernicus, Kepler, Tycho, Tycho Galileo, and then there's Patrizzi. I'm sorry, then there's Telesio. Yeah. Seems rather different mm -hmm. from all of the others. All of the others are in one way or another mathematicians. Um, and you can see how it is that it would fit with the, uh, how all of them would fit into the mathematics curriculum and into the um, mathematics theses. Um, how, why Telesio and how is it that Telesio um, is um, um, actually read, understood, integrated into the um, 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 discussions in Edinburgh? Mm. I, I'll try and answer the second question first. Um, it's, it's a difficult one. Um, one of the strange things that we noticed it, when we first started looking at it, we saw it was clearly the theses astronomicae and the theses physicae that were just sections of the manuscript taken out and, and, and put in over many, many years. But then we started to recognize that the theses metaphysicae were also heavily <laughs> indebted to the manuscript. And this, this is something we've not really looked at in a tremendous amount of detail yet. When you, when you look at Adam King, when he's speaking in his own voice in the manuscript, I do not see how did it, he seems to be very, very skeptical of philosophical modeling in, in general. But that doesn't stop him from having a discussion of what he calls the metaphysical trivialities of the schools. He, he, he still engages with it. The, the picture that we've got of how, that's not what we're gonna do in the first couple of years for this. We're gonna focus on the astronomical and the mathematical stuff, but it is a fascinating question about. You know, the, but Talesio, of course, I mean, part of the reason why I think Talesio is really, really interesting um, the mathematics, I would imagine, is a little bit aside from the philosophical stuff that looked, from what I could read, 
which was not much on the uh, very tiny um, screen. Mm -hmm. It looks like they were teaching Aristotelian philosophy. Mm -hmm. Maddox is going to be a little bit different, but Talesia was anti-Aristotelian, providing an alternative natural philosophy yeah. mm -hmm. that was intended to be very, very different. Yeah, it, mo motion, motion is, is one of the key elements. Uh, um, the, the way he cited, it's usually got to do with explanation for motion in either a fluid universe or a non-fluid universe, but what is pushing things um, and as we see it through the material universe, is it some form of heat? Um, and this is where we get into some of the Telesio stuff and some of his ideas coming out of the right. Um it, Again, I've not went into a tremendous amount of detail. It's only been a superficial reading, but this is where Telesio is employed when a lot of the discussions about, well, we've thrown this out completely. We've rejected this, that's gone. What do we replace it with? This person says this, and then King will go into a lot of detail. Um, I mean, he will cite De Rerum Natura, he'll cite various other individuals as well. But again, purely superficially, in relation to Telesio, from what I've seen so far, it's, it's been on uh, Telesio's ideas about motion and what, what causes motion uh, in celestial objects. Um, why Venice? Well, move, on, move on to that. that that's, a, that's a good question. It, I started with Thomas Nicholson in the wedding party. There are other individuals who go down to Venice as well. Archibald Douglas, who is the brother of James Douglas, who left all of John Craig's books. Archibald Douglas and James Douglas are this, the sons of William Douglas of Whittingham, who was ambassador to the court of Denmark under Mary, Queen of Scots, and then under James as well. So for a long period of time, almost half a century. And Archibald Douglas goes down to and from the Venetian Republic. So there is movement before the wedding. Um, but it seems to be with the wedding and with a few individuals out of the wedding party, and then subsequently people associated with those people out of the wedding party that start the, 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 the almost as I think I said, a sort of unbroken chain of individuals matriculating at the Venetian Republic over a 25 year period. The wedding seems to, to be the thing. I, I thought, well, maybe- so, so, Which is to say it's almost a matter of chance. It, it could be, it could also be the Earl Marshal. The Earl Marshal who marries Queen Anne in, in James's stead. The Earl Marshal does travel down to Italy at some point beforehand. And it could have been on the recommendation of the Earl Marshal that they go down, that Thomas Nicholson specifically uh, goes down to Venice. But yeah, I think it, from, again, we're only really at the foothills of investigation of this. Um, it, it seems to be Nicholson and almost chance he starts and then everyone follows him afterwards for a long period. Um, Pietro, you have a question about Padua. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you very much, David. Um, so I have two, there are two points I'm very interested in. One is Padua as a center of encounter of scholars and students from all over Europe. So that's something um, that has still to be investigated. So we have their Scots, English students, Italian students from different provinces. We have Greeks, Jewish students. We have Spanish, Polish students from Eastern. So that's really the place where people with different backgrounds get together. And I wonder, I have no answer, how much we can detect of this from the, from the acts that are preserved in the, in, the, in the university. I started with the German students, but there is plenty of materials to be investigated. But this specific dimension of encounter in Padua has not been studied uh, so much as it deserves. So there are many studies on nations because the students were organized around nations, not so much the integrated picture. And um, so speaking of the Scottish students, uh, they seem to play a very crucial role in the early 17th century. Uh, and uh, just to mention one name that uh, I think you, you didn't mention, uh, I'm not sure, is, the, is um, Wedderburn, the one who defends Galileo uh, Siderius Nuncius. And 
there we can also assess connections through the documents of the university and the role these students had in, the, in their colleges. So for instance, Wedderburn had a, an important role in, in the Scottish na nation at some point, and obviously he interacted with Galileo and his group. So this is one, one issue that, uh, you know, this, the, Scot the Scots among other nations. The other point I think is very interesting and you stress very well is the, is the paths of circulation of scholars. This, they seem not to be random. Um, so we, we have to, to assess what is the reason that leads students to, to follow certain pat, um, patterns. To be sure, Helmstedt and, De and Denmark seem to play an important role, as well as Rostock and so on. So let me, on this, just mention two facts, and then, sorry, I, I, I try to be shorter. Um, one is, um, so two facts that lead to Helmstedt and help seeing further networks. So there is a letter by the German humanist Caselius to uh, John Craig, the, the elder, uh, with the an appraisal of, of Liddell in which, that's an important detail, he mentions that the nephew, John Craig Jr., went to Helmstedt, was hosted by Liddell, so there is a Scottish connection, mm -hmm. but then he moved to Venice, actually to Padua. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the letter, they mention the interdict of the Roman interdict. So there is a political background to that. So when Sarpi and, you know, the, this, the Venetian intellectuals and theologians face the Roman excommunication, the Scots write about that in Northern Europe and the exchange letters. So there is, you know, this political dimension, which is not really confessional, perhaps it's more politi political. And Helmstedt, so you mentioned Heinrich Julius and the, the marriage with the, with, the, with, the, with the daughter of the King of Denmark. The other, uh, the, so the two daughters were married, one with the King of yeah. Scotland and England and the other one with the, with the Duke of Bruns Brunswick in the moment in which he was the patron of Giordano Bruno, who also moved to Padua. So you see, there is further connections that might also be detected. Yeah, yeah, uh, 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 absolutely. I mean, I, when Dan asked there a second ago about why Venice, uh, I kind of pulled back from, the, there is another possibility, a political dimension, which you've just mentioned there. There are a host of other Scots who go there who are quite clearly being paid by King James to spy. Um, on various individuals. Now, those who know about King James tend to think of as anti-Catholic pogroms, but from, from the evidence of the individuals who go into the Venetian Republic and what James pays them and what they seem to be up to, James seemed to be more concerned about the Calvinists than he actually was the Catholics. And there was a conspiracy before Guy Fawkes, five years before Guy Fawkes, there was the so-called Gowrie conspiracy, um, where John Ruthven, Earl of Gowrie, was apparently tried to assassinate the king. And the king summarily executed both John Ruthven and Alexander Ruthven, his brother, at Ruthven Castle, uh, raised the castle and gave all of the estates away in perpetuity to the Earls of Tully Barton. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about this particular event, why James did it, and there's a lot of nonsense about James being perhaps in love with John Ruthven or something like that. But John Ruthven went to Padua and he was followed round Padua by various Scottish uh, people who were in the pay of James and were given pensions afterwards. One of them was the son of the Earl of Tully Barton, who was given all of the lands of John Ruthven, and in one account is said to have had prior knowledge of the Gowrie conspiracy. So there is a very good chance that many of the Scots who were there in the 1590s were actually actively spying on a Calvinist uh, group of individuals, the Ruthvens, uh, the Gowries, who then came back to Scotland and, and, and within a matter of months of them touching soil in Scotland, they were assassinated by the king. The Calvinists were in uproar about it and uh, Adam King had to very quickly write a tract exonerating the king, um, a legal tract which survives. He had to write it um, anonymously uh, because Adam King was a Catholic. He was expelled in 1594 from Paris for being a, a member of the Catholic League. Um, so there's a lot to, political. You, you're right to use the term political because it is such a complicated environment that James is in. It's neither pro Calvinist or pro Catholic. He's negotiating a very fine line and and Venice does seem to be somewhere where this plays out for whatever reasons. And it's going to be great over the next few years to actually look 
at that and the context of the nations and the different confessional backgrounds that are going there. Bruno has been mentioned as well there as well, because of course he goes into the Venetian Republic and what impact is that? But it's 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 difficult and uh, it will be interesting to see if we can bring some clarity to it. What we can say is of course, regardless of the imp impetus to motion into the Venetian Republic, that what comes out of it is something very significant for the University of Edinburgh and the establishment of the new sciences at the University of Edinburgh in the 17th century. I mean, that much we can say is, 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 is clear. Why they were all there, why so many of them were there is a tad murkier and, and, and we'll certainly need a lot more look through the archives at Padua to try and get a handle on. Well, I think we're out of time. Um, I'd like you all to turn on your microphones and thank our two speakers. for a very, very interesting session. Um, we are breaking for the month of August, but we're gonna be back on September 8th with Yitzhak Malamed from Johns Hopkins University talking about Spinoza on Causa Sui. Um, have a good August and um, we'll see you, we'll see you in uh, the fall. The rest of the schedule is available on our, um, um, on our website. So have a good have a good uh, summer vacation. <laughs>